السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له. وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله. I want to begin a little story. Imagine, if you will, that a person is sleeping in his bed. It's about 7 o'clock in the morning. He's had a good night's sleep, yet he doesn't have any work or he doesn't have to go to uni that day, so he's still feeling lazy. So he decides to go back to sleep. Then he hears faint noise outside, like a knock or a rumbling. It stirs him a bit, but he easily falls asleep again. But then this time, the knock comes louder, and it startles him, and he wakes him up. Yet again, he tries to ignore it. He still wants to go back to sleep. And the third time, the knock is getting louder, and the rumbling is getting louder, and he starts to feel the house shake. And he's still trying to ignore it. And then the noise becomes consistent. And the rumbling consistent and so powerful, the parts of the house start shaking. The things start falling off the walls, the paintings start falling off the walls, his bed is rumbling. But he's still trying to ignore it. And then the rumbling and the knocks become so loud that the whole house is starting to shake. Parts of the ceiling are starting to tumble. Until eventually the ceiling collapses, falls on him and it kills him. This is the example of someone who does not believe in the existence of the Creator. And he continuously ignores the existence of the Creator. Just as he can see or feel or hear the signs coming from outside, or can hear the, he, he can hear these knocks, he can hear the rumbling, he knows for certain something is making that sound and that movement, Yet he continues to ignore it. Even though he cannot see it, he knows it's there, he feels its effects until eventually it kills him. That is an example of someone that denies the existence of the Creator, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because it's very simple to establish the existence of the Creator. It is through his signs, subhanahu wa ta'ala. As he, subhanahu wa ta'ala, says in the Quran, rajim إن في خلق السماوات والأرض واختلاف الليل والنهار لآيات لآيات لأولي الألباب. That verily, in the creation of the heavens and earth, the difference between the night and the day are signs for men of understanding. And the human being, what differentiates him from other creations of Allah, is that he was given the capability, the power of thought, to think about things, to contemplate. And it's these things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks him to use. That when you look around you, and you start asking these big questions in life, about life, about the universe, about man, what am I doing here, where did I come from? Then you use that intellect that God gave you. Think, ponder. Look at the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And those signs are so evident, and so truthful, and so certain, that you'd have to be completely arrogant and ignorant to ignore them. Just as the man that was sleeping in his bed, he could feel the ceiling crumbling down upon him, that he continuously ignored it, even though he knew certainty, and he could see the effects of what is happening around him. So to prove the existence of Allah, it is the most natural and self-evident truth. It is not really difficult to prove. Nor is there really any argument to disprove the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because it's very simple. Look at the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at man, the complex creature that man is. The different systems that are at work in his body. If the brain itself, still scientists cannot understand the way it operates, the way it works. All the millions upon millions of calculations that it can perform. Look at the earth. Look at the animals. Look at the, the environment, the trees, the oceans. 
The difference between night and day. They look at the universe itself. This creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We know, if we look at and it's something smaller than the universe, look at our solar system. We have nine planets. There is a sun. Right? Massive distances between them. And still to this day, all we have reached, the only place we've reached to is the moon. And with great difficulty. Right? And they're trying to think about getting to Mars, but it's such an enormous job that it's, they still have not found a way to get there. How about the other planets in the solar system? The distances between them. Right? The expanse, uh, how massive the sun is compared to the earth and the other planets. That's just the solar system. How about when we look at our galaxy, the Milky Way? Right? It's 100,000 light years from end to end. With billions of stars like the sun in the galaxy. That's just the galaxy. And you start looking further than that and you find there are millions of galaxies. There are billions upon billions of stars and planets. And imagine all of this creation. And yet we somehow want to think that it created itself. It came into being by itself. Right? Look at the example. If you came into a room and you found one of those little cubes. The one that has six sides and you form all the different colors perfectly. If you found it lying on the table with no one around it. Would you believe that this thing formed itself? Because you know it's, it's pretty complex, right? That maybe if you picked one up and it was jumbled, you could form one side, one color, right? But if you were to do more than that, it requires like deep knowledge. There's calculations involved, right? Hundreds of calculations and steps in order for you to completely get all the colors perfectly and not ruin any other sides. And you couldn't do it unless you learned how it was meant to be done. That's a little cube. And you couldn't believe, nobody would believe that it was just there by itself, unless somebody put it together, or somebody made it. It's pretty complex, but it's, compared to the universe, it's a fairly simple thing. If we cannot believe a cube could form itself, then how could you believe the universe could create itself? Uh, with all its complexity, all its laws. And so it's pretty evident that there is a creator, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the logical way of thinking. That if you ask the scientist, try and convince him that cube formed itself, naturally he would think you're crazy, right? Because he's using his rationale, the, the normal human thinking, that things cannot put themselves together. Yet when it comes to universe, to the creation, he does away with this type of thinking. He does away with the rationale, and he brings all kinds of magnificent theories, such as the Big Bang. That all these things created themselves from nothing. So it's really pretty simple and easy to prove the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when we look at everything around us, we look at the universe, everything has two characteristics. Everything is limited and everything is dependent. Everything is limited meaning everything has a beginning and an end. Nothing is continuous, nothing is eternal. Even the stars, they have a beginning and they have an end. In the end, uh, they're worn out. The, the fire ceases to exist. Everything in the universe is like that. From the most magnificent of creations such as the stars, to the simplest things such as a fly or an ant. They all have a beginning and they all have an end. The second characteristic is that everything is dependent upon something else. Nothing exists by its own nature. Everything requires what is around it. Whether it's from the human being, uh, his need for water, for air, for food, to the animals, right, to the trees, to different creations upon the earth, to the stars and the suns themselves. Right? They all rely, just to take one example, they rely on a specific orbit. They rely upon gravity to stay situated in that place. If they did not have their orbits, they would all move from their place and collide and they would be destroyed. So everything has these two characteristics. It is limited and it is dependent upon something else. So therefore we come to the conclusion with certainty by thinking rationally that there is a creator. And this is the most self-evident truth. Just because we cannot see that creator, just like the man that was sleeping in his bed, he could not see what was making that sound right, and that movement. But yet he knew with certainty that it was made by something. Maybe somebody came with a tractor and was bringing down his house. 
Even though he could not see it, but he knew. He could see the signs. And we can see the signs of the Creator, even though we cannot see him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is how we prove with certainty, with rationale, with the intellect, that definitely the Creator exists. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there is really no other explanation for the creation of the universe and man. Naturally, if the Creator exists, then He must have sent a revelation or a guidance to mankind in order to guide them. Right? So that they know what is required of them from their Creator, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Creator sends His messengers to mankind. Right? He sends them revelation in order to guide the human beings, because we cannot have any contact, direct contact with Allah. So He sends the messengers through the revelation. And we know the last message of the Prophet Muhammad And for any messenger, for anyone that claims that he comes from God with a revelation, well, he has to have something that decisively proves that what he has is from the Creator, that he is a messenger, that he has revelation. Something that is beyond the capabilities of, of the human being. When we see his miracle, we establish that it's not possible for it to be from human beings. Therefore, it must be from the Creator. Therefore, He really is a messenger. And to prove the validity of the messenger of Allah, we just need to prove the Qur'an, its source is from the Creator, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once we have proven that the Qur'an, its source is from the Creator, then the messenger of Allah, He must be really a messenger because of this miracle that He has. And the miracle of the messenger of Allah is the Qur'an. Even though he had other miracles, but those miracles were only witnessed by those that lived with him. But he had one miracle that was everlasting, that continued to last throughout the ages. And that is the Qur'an. So that in every generation, right, the claim of the Messenger of Allah could be proven true, and Islam will continue as a religion, as a way of life, to the day of judgment. And to prove the Qur'an is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right, we do this through three ways. Either it is through the language and the contents of the Qur'an or the second one is to prove where the, the source of the Qur'an, where the Qur'an could have come from. Or the third one is by looking at the legislation of the Qur'an. We can prove the Qur'an decisively through any of those means. And I'll briefly discuss each of these points and bring a few examples due to the time constraints. So we said the first way to prove that the Qur'an it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it could not be from human beings. It is to look at its language and its eloquence and its contents. We know the Qur'an was revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in the Arabic language. And the Arabic language, at the time that it was revealed in the Arabs, they were the best in, the, in their language. Right? They had the highest forms of Arabic eloquence and literature. They used to compete in poetry. Such was the strength in the Arabic language, was unsurpassed. And the Qur'an came down in Arabic, and it challenged them to bring forth something like the Qur'an, to bring a surah like the Qur'an. And as great as the Arabs were in the language, they were never able to bring anything similar to Qur'an or better than the Qur'an. And this is established throughout history. Because if it was so, they had brought something like the Qur'an, we know when something is original, or at last it's unique. But if something is uh, uh, imitated, it loses its significance. Or it becomes like everything else. And throughout the ages, it's no longer unique and it's forgotten about. But we know this did not happen with the Quran. Nothing was brought forth to rival the Quran. Nothing was brought forth like the language of the Quran. And really, you could establish this just by looking at the Qur'an and reading it. But of course, you'd have to be all versed in Arabic grammar, Arabic language, the depth of, uh, of knowledge in Arabic, right? which most of us do not have that. But even so, all right, just by listening to the Qur'an, you can establish that this is not from, uh, from, from a human being. You could establish the miraculous nature of its language, of its rhythm. All right? Most of us don't know Arabic that well. Yet many of us have memorized many, uh, many surahs from the Qur'an, right? Even now, we might know what most of them mean. And we know just by listening to the Qur'an, right, you compare it to any other form, 
uh, or whether it's music or literature, poetry, whatever it is, that you find something just by listening to it and it's so unique, it is moving, it really touches you. Because it's not from the works of the human being, but it's from the Creator, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there is one way to prove, right, from the language and also the contents of the Qur'an. We look at the contents of the Qur'an, so many descriptions given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an, that this, it's not possible or feasible that a human being at that time in Arabia could have had this knowledge. I'll just mention a few brief examples. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, وَالْخَيْلَ وَالْبِغَالَ وَالْحَمِيرُ لِتَرْكَبُوهَا وَزِينَ وَيَخْرُقُ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Allah describes the creation that he created the horse, he created the mule and the donkey. So he may ride upon it and as an adornment. And he creates that which you, don't, you, know, you know not. Now these are all forms of transport that they used at that time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that he creates other than these that which you do not know. And later we knew the creation of aeroplanes, of cars, of submarines, of trains, all right? If this was from a human being or the Prophet Sallallahu how could he have possibly known all right, that, the, that forms of transport would change? How could he make this prediction that things will be created that you know not? And it wasn't until like a, a, a thousand years until we saw these new forms of creation. So we can see it's something that the Messenger of Allah could never have known. And therefore it must be revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he makes an oath by the stars. He says, فَلَا أُقْصِنُوا بِمَوَاقِعِ النُّجُومِ That verily I make an oath by the positions of the stars. وَإِنَّهُ لَقَصَمٌ لَوْ تَعْلَمُونَ عَظِيمٌ And this is really a, a, an oath that if indeed you knew, it is a great oath. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling Quraysh, the Arabs at that time, that I make an oath by the positions of the stars. And if you knew, but they didn't know the positions, right, this is really a great oath. Because that time astronomy was at its most basic form. Really all they could do was look up at the sky. And they saw these stars. They didn't know their distances. They didn't know how big they were. They could have been as they looked really tiny and small. Yet now we know uh, the, the size of their creation. We know the distances of the stars. We know that stars are millions and millions of light years away. Even the closest star to our, to our solar system it is incomprehensible that we could ever reach those distances. So now therefore we understand this oath by Allah. When He makes an oath by the positions of the stars, it's something that at that time they could not have known. Nor could anybody have made this kind of oath if it was really from a human being. Because nobody knew the positions of the stars. We could really mention many examples. Uh, the, the, description, the description of the heavens and the earth, the orbits uh, uh, in, the, in the solar of the stars and the planets. We could mention the creation in the womb. These are things that anybody could really easily research. And you find many, many verses and many, many examples to prove from the contents of the Qur'an that it could not have come from a human being who lived at that time. Because these are all scientific discoveries that were only recently made. So that's one way to prove that the Qur'an is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is through its language and through its contents. The second way to prove it is to find out, look at the possible sources of the Qur'an. Because the Qur'an came down at the time of the Messenger of Allah. Since it was in Arabic, it could only have had three possible sources. Either it was from the Arabs, or it was from the Messenger, or it was revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we established earlier that the Arabs Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put the challenge for them to bring something like the Qur'an and they were not able to. And history has recorded that nothing till this present day has ever been brought like the Qur'an to match its eloquence, to match its style, to match its language, its word usage. So therefore we establish it could not have been from this source. So there are only two possible sources left. Maybe it could have been from the Messenger of Allah. Maybe it could have been that the Messenger of Allah read the Qur'an. And let us discuss this. Our Prophet he was he was illiterate. He could not read or write. But he was like the rest of the Arabs in his language and his understanding of, of the language. If they could not bring something like it, then how would the Messenger of Allah be able to surpass all of them and he himself bring something like it when he was from the Arabs himself? Right? He was bought, bred, bred and born amongst them and raised up amongst them. If they could not do it, 
and how could he do it? At the same time, when you look at the verses of the Quran, you find many instances the Prophet of Allah, he's sort of, he lightly criticized by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, in one verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuha nabi lima tuharrimu ma halallahu lak. O Prophet, why do you make that unlawful, prohibited for yourself, something which Allah has made allowable? Right? And that was referring to a case where the Messenger of Allah had an argument with his wives, and he said that he made an oath for Allah, he would never eat honey again. So Allah revealed the verse, why are you making this prohibited? When Allah has made it allowed, it's halal for you. If this was from the Messenger of Allah, he would never criticize himself in this way. If I was to write a book, I wanted people to follow me, I wanted to lead people, or I would hold myself in the highest standards. I would praise myself consistently. I would not criticize myself if I was an imposter. Another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Abasa wa tawalla and jahul a'ma. That referring to the Messenger of Allah, that he frowned and turned away because the blind man came to him. And this was referring to an incident where the Prophet, during the Makkah stage, he was making da'wah to the leaders of Quraysh. But then a blind man came to him, and he wanted the Messenger of Allah to teach him. But the Messenger of Allah, he frowned and turned away from him, and continued talking to the leaders of Quraysh. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala criticized him for this, and revealed these verses, that he should have left the leaders of Quraysh, and he should have answered the one that was, the Muslim that was seeking knowledge from him. Again, we see this same point. That if the Messenger of Allah, he wrote the Qur'an himself, he would not bring or write or create these kinds of verses that he would criticize himself in this way. And there are many, many examples, we could go through many ayat where instances like this occur. Therefore, we've established not from the Arabs, nor is it from the Messenger of Allah, the Qur'an has other, you know, there's only one other possible source, it is revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right, so that's another way to establish that the Qur'an is from Allah. It's by looking at the sources of the Qur'an, where it could have come from. The third way is by looking at the legislation of the Qur'an. Islam as an ideology. Islam as a way of life. We know that in the, the legislation that is included in the Qur'an, or you can establish it is miraculous by the legislation in the Qur'an. That of all the ideologies that we have around us, if you take capitalism, communism as an example, where there are systems and they provide answers for life and solutions, but nothing compares to the legislation that is included in the Quran. Nothing fits with the nature, the filter of the human being as the legislation in the Quran. Nothing solves the social ills of the society as the legislation in the Quran. And we know ideologies that take hundreds of years to be perfected. Many different intellectuals would come, one would say some specific things, another one would succeed him, and come about and say, no, this was wrong, this is the way it should be. This is what happened with capitalism and communism. They were discussed endlessly. And yet in the end, we saw the downfall of communism, and now we see the downfall of capitalism. And the recent global financial crisis is an example of the, the economic system, how it's unsuitable for men. But we find, that the station of the Qur'an was revealed over a period of 23 years and then it was established and nothing was further added or deleted from the Qur'an and yet through like a manner, through a period of 20 years Islam spread from Mecca until it engulfed Arabia and all the outer areas around them until it conquered the Persian Empire and the Roman Empire within a matter of 20 years now, this is not something that could have been possible unless it was from really a revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we still saw that when, when people met the Muslims, they came to contact with the revelation, right? Because when, said, when the Muslims conquered the land, then they would establish Islam, and Islam would be implemented on, upon the society. When the people saw this, they saw the legislation of Islam, the mercy of Islam, how it solved all their problems, en masse, in their millions, people entered into Islam. This hasn't occurred with any other ideology except Islam. Because it is a revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And just to point a side note to this, but you know, it really shows that, that now, nowadays, that since that legislation is not there as a system, you know, Islam, the Quran, it's a comprehensive way of life. 
Right? And that's what made it successful in the past. That it was taken to the people, it was implemented upon them, it dominated their lives whether they were Muslim or non-Muslim. And that's how they saw really the miraculous nature of Islam. And they entered into Islam in, in their millions. But unfortunately that is something now. The legislation is there in the Quran, but as a system, as a state dominating, implementing the rules of Allah, that no longer exists and there is something that we should work for once more again, inshallah. And then really people will see what Islam is like. They will witness firsthand with their day-to-day -day dealings the miraculous nature of the Quran and the system. Just to summarize, these are the three ways that we prove that the Quran it is a revelation from Allah. We said by looking at its language, even if you're not an Arab, you can still appreciate its content, its eloquence, and, uh, and the information that is given in the Qur'an that could not have possibly been known by man at that time. It was until hundreds and a thousand years later that all the scientific discoveries really occurred. But just to mention also that the Qur'an, even though we mention this, it's not a book of science. It's not a book where from it you derive the scientific theories. It is a book of legislation. But there are miraculous things mentioned in the Qur'an. So that is one way, the language and the contents. The second one is to look at the possible sources of the Qur'an. We said it's either Arabs or the Messenger or it's revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you look at the first two possible sources and you count them out, any possible source is that it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the third way to establish that is a revelation from Allah is through the legislation of the Qur'an. The legislation of Islam. How it has survived throughout all of these years has never been changed never been deleted, it is just as suitable in this time as it was at the time of the Messenger of Allah. That it came with an economic system, it came with a judicial system, it came with laws for society, it came with laws for all of mankind. And nothing has yet surpassed this as an ideology. So we see from all, from these three ways that we can, any other one of them, establish with certainty that the Qur'an, its only possible source, is the creator of the heavens and the earth, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it could not have come from a human being, because it's beyond the capability of human beings. And once we prove that the Qur'an, it is from Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, therefore we prove the claim of the Messenger, because he has this miracle, he has this revelation from Allah, that proves beyond a doubt that his claim is true. He is the Messenger of Allah. Islam is the true religion. And nothing else with certainty, Wallahi, my brothers, is true except Islam. And I'll leave it there, inshallah. And um, if anybody has any questions or answers, we've got a bit of time, 10 minutes. I'm glad you try and answer them, inshallah. Non-Muslims or non-Arabs, I'm sorry, uh, can appreciate uh, the language of the Quran. How can they know uh, its structure? Because it's been translated by yeah. them. They can't really appreciate the language fully. They can get some idea by the translation in, in, in the descriptions that are given, right? But really, it's mostly through the contents of the Quran that they'll really appreciate the Quran. So they can appreciate, appreciate the form of its language in some way by the descriptions given in the Qur'an. Right? Even though they are translated, they still really are the descriptions. They're, they're, they're pretty amazing and miraculous. But that's only... You know, but they can never fully appreciate the Arabic, the, the language, unless we are Arabs. But like we said, you can still prove it even though they don't understand the language through its contents, through uh, looking at the, the, the possible sources of the Qur'an, or through its legislation. You can still prove it in those ways, you, know, you can prove with certainty that it is from Allah, even though they do not understand the language of the Qur'an. Right? Because we saw this in the past, and you know, other than Arabia, when the Muslims took Islam to the other, other countries around them, none of them were Arabs. Yeah, they entered into Islam en masse, right? because of all these reasons that we mentioned. Because of the contents of the Qur'an, because of the legislation of the Qur'an, really, and the, the implementation of the legislation, really was a, a fundamental reason for, for, for the conversion of these people en masse. That is something that we cannot appreciate in our times because Islam, even though we carry as individuals, 
that the Quran is not there as a system. So we can't see now really the, the conversion. There are even though like uh, there are thousands that convert to Islam, but we can never see them convert in their millions as whole countries until they witness the legislation implemented upon them. Then they'll truly understand that this is revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If anybody wants to add a comment, it doesn't have to be a Christian. Yeah. Just a question. Um, generally, Muslims will uh, be able to understand that the reason they believe in Allah is because of His signs and everything. But how important is it for us as Muslims to be able to articulate that in, um, you know, in more defined ways? So, do we need to know sort of the detailed? rational arguments, or is it sufficient for us to just know the generalities? Uh, that's a very good point, actually, a very good point. Definitely that um, in his, some, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala condemns in the Qur'an blind faith. And he mentioned in verses, many verses that the people of Quraysh, they followed their forefathers blindly. Right? And they didn't use their, their, their intellect, their thinking. So definitely as Muslims, you cannot just be a Muslim because that's all, that's all you've known. You grew up in that state. But you have to be able to prove to yourself rationally, using your intellect, mentioning, these, uh, mentioning all these examples that we gave, that really the Allah exists, that the Quran is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Because like that, your belief is firm and is grounded. Right? Because you've come to that real realization through your intellect, intellectually, through rational argument. And this is something, as I mentioned in that verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala consistently talks about ulil al-bab, men are understanding, ulil al-absar, those who see and comprehend. And he asks us, أَفَلَا يَنْظُرُونَ إِلَى الْإِبْلِ كَيْفَ خُلِقَتْ Do not see how the camel was created, or the heavens were raised. So we ask consistently to think, to comprehend. Right? And as Muslims, definitely, you have to be able to prove your belief. That's why this, I mean, this was important today, prove your belief rationally, through the intellect. Like that, it, it comes to rest in your heart in, in a, a really... With, uh, with, hum uh, with humility, like uh, it rests there calmly, right? It's situated really deep in your heart, and you are satisfied that Islam really is from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. You are firmly grounded with that belief, and that becomes unshakable. And that was one of the reasons why the Sahaba was so successful, is that Islam was implanted into their hearts, that it could not be shaken anymore, because of these reasons. جزاكم الله في الاستناقل وقول هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته